Well, it all started with this volcano here, Tate volcano, and uh, this here is an old Dutch drawing, and uh, the Dutch were very good in sailing up and down all the oceans, and of course, they tried to help each other by drawing images of landmarks. So as a navigational tool, they said here, the peak of Tenerife, the peak of Tede. And of course, it looks awfully steep. It's of course not quite as steep. And uh, they pictured it to be above the clouds. Here you can just about see the clouds. And, uh, and they also had the Anaga Peninsula here, uh, a long ridge extending from the central part. And if you look at Tede today, you see that the peak is, uh, well, peaking out above the clouds, and uh, this is something that is widely visible and therefore a very useful navigational landmark that uh, sailors could see. And um, this gave Tede a very famed, I need to coordinate that now, um, a reputation here, but nobody really knew how high Tede was. For a long time it was considered the highest point on earth. And it was even believed that if you were to go up there, you'd be burned. You'd be burned to death. <laughs> and um, the Icarus concept, if you will. So, and uh, there was a lot of uncertainty. And this, of course, this legend that surrounded uh, Tede, this was something that inspired people. And in addition, there was an eruption in uh, 1798 on Tenerife, and there was previously historical eruptions, 1704 and 5, and 1706, and this concept of the potentially highest mountain in the world, altitude was something Humboldt was fascinated about, and we'll come back to this later, plus this concept of volcanic eruptions that people described, this drew Humboldt to come to Tede. And uh, why this eruption phenomenon was so important, I'll talk about this in a few minutes, but let's look at uh, Mr. Humboldt himself. So when uh, the Prussian nobleman, he was a young man at the time, Alexander von Humboldt, heard about these things, he was keen to explore these features for himself. And um, these were big puzzles at the time, and the actual height of the volcano of Tede was important also. There was a big debate out there of how basaltic rocks actually formed. Today we know it's lava, but at the time there was two rival concepts. One was that basaltic rock has precipitated from ocean water. And this was really, really widely believed at the time. And the other school thought it's volcanic eruptions. And Humboldt was taught by a Neptunist, somebody who believed it's formed from ocean water. So when he set out to see this alleged volcanic eruption for himself, he actually came with a completely different view to the island. And uh, the altitude effects on plant life and humans was something he was very fascinated about as well. So, a few words about him as a person. He was born 14th September 1769 in Berlin, and the Duke of Brunswick was actually his godfather. And um, he was uh, brought up in Tegel, which is just outside Berlin. Nowadays, there's an airport there. And um, the family estate, which I'm showing down here, it's uh, rather pretty, but not too large. And his father was an officer in the Prussian army, and his mother was of uh, Huguenot descent, so she was of French uh, Protestant descent. There was a wave of emigrants from France uh, a few decades before. And um, he had a private tutor. He didn't go to a public school. And the private tutor is well known in uh, these circles, I'm told. And uh, here, I haven't really read much about him, but I thought I'll provide his name anyway. So, and um, in 1779, his father dies, and he has to go off to university. He's first enrolled at the University of Frankfurt Oder, which is the other Frankfurt, not the one in the center of Germany, but the one near the present-day Polish border. And he had an older brother, Wilhelm von Humboldt, and the two of them were sent to university together. He studies for civil servant career, but he didn't like it. It didn't go very well, and it's reported that he had only moderate success. So, and um, he uh, then changes universities, as students sometimes do, and he swaps his uh, activity to uh, the University of Göttingen, where in 1789 he starts working there. And then he starts to realize that he has a 
a knack for adventure, and he starts to find pleasure in traveling. And he teams up with uh, Georg Forster, who was a world traveler who actually sailed with James Cook, and uh, there he gets a lot of these fascinating stories from all over the world. And then he changes again. He goes to the uh, Handels Academy, the Trade Academy in Hamburg, and there he learns about the big, wide world, 1790, 91. And then he travels for quite some time to the Netherlands, to France, to England. You can see his travels go further and further out there. And in London, he uh, meets the president of the Royal Society, Joseph Banks, and there he was shown the collections of South Sea specimens. And that really switched him on to become an explorer. Then he uh, registers in the uh, Prussian Mining Service, and uh, he's employed there. And uh, he's trained at the Academy of Mines in Freiburg, Saxony. And there he's also getting in contact with this gentleman here, Professor Gottlob Werner. And he is the ultimate Neptunist. He is the person who really pushes this concept of basaltic rocks forming from seawater precipitation. And um, later he was disproved, but he was actually a big shot at the time. The Venerian concept that it was known was so widespread that most scientists actually believed that basalt forms by ocean water, uh, forms from ocean water. Only later this did change. And I always remind students, just because the majority of people believe in something doesn't make it true. You have to be very, very careful about that. So, and this is a classic example of this kind of idea. So, then he works as a mining engineer in various parts of the uh, uh, Prussian territory and Prussian allied territories. He's sent to supervise mines, and it's said that some of the mines he was supervising, they suddenly experienced an increase in production. It's not entirely clear whether it was entirely his doing or whether he had some help there, but some of the mines were suddenly increasing the gold production by factor eight. And of course, this helped him a lot to be promoted. And he starts to publish then at that time as well. He, publish, he publishes on mineralogical observation of basaltic rocks that, as I said, we now know to be lava. And he visits various areas that we now know to be volcanic provinces in the borderlands between France and Germany. And um, there, the La Chasse volcanic province is very famed. It's still believed to be active, and uh, he looks at the rocks there. He travels through Austria, Switzerland, and he publishes it on cave botany. He had a thing for caves as well. So all of these works and his success gave him access to uh, the uh, brightest mind of the time, and he was invited to meet with people like... Uh, uh, von Goethe and Schiller, the uh, big poets, the German writers, and uh, here he's shown a meeting with these gentlemen and they are discor having discourses about all sorts of things, and this was also very influential. And um, there he has a second trip to Switzerland in 1797, and uh, then something strange happens, and that is the death of his mother. I tried to find out a little more, but apparently the relationship between Alexander von Humboldt and his mother was not particularly good. And as soon as she died, he broke all bonds to his life so far. And he inherits, together with his brother, the family fortune, and he immediately quits his state service. So here, within uh, a month of the death of the mother, he says, I don't want to be a civil servant anymore. Uh, I want to explore the world. So somehow this um, family tragedy has changed the way he operates entirely. And he starts immediately to prepare for a great trip to South America. So he takes several years to prepare this trip. And uh, this is a map of the trip. We're going to go through it a little more later on. But he travels from uh, Spain all the way through the Canary Islands to um, the northern part of South America. He travels around there, and he goes all the way to the Pacific. He travels up to Mexico, to the United States. He even meets the president. I'll come back to that later. And eventually, he comes back to Spain. So, en route to America, um, he visits Tenerife for 
actually only one week, and um, this uh, started 5th of June, 1799. Well, he had a passport from the Queen of Spain, so he had access to all the kind of uh, high society and all the support from the local authorities. This is something that uh, Darwin later did not have. When Darwin came to uh, Tenerife, the Beagle was refused access to the port. This was because uh, only 30, a little over 30 years before, Nelson tried to actually capture Santa Cruz and failed, and there was bad relationships between Spain and the UK at the time. And so the Beagle was told there's a cholera epidemic in Santa Cruz. There is no record of a cholera <laughs> epidemic that year. So this was a diplomatic kind of coup in order to make sure that the British ship would not enter port. But Humboldt had a different setup. He had a letter from the Queen, and um, this opened all the doors for him. So he comes here for one week. He visits Tate Volcano. He visits La Laguna, the capital. He visits the Anaga Forest and, of course, the Orotava Valley. Here's the Orotava Valley which was the agricultural hub at the time, and uh, also a lot of noble families were clustering in that area, and there was a lot of money in that area. So he does a lot of research in that single week, and it's so impressive. So he really was the first volcano researcher, so to say, um, that traveled to the Canary Islands. So he had also a very busy social calendar, loads of dinners with the noble families here, and apparently there was a, a little flirt with one of the young daughters of uh, one of the noble families, but I couldn't find out a lot of details about that. So, but um, he has eventually to cancel a trip to San Juan de las Ramblas, which is uh, along the north coast of Tenerife, because the Beagle then, uh, sorry, not the Beagle, uh, his ship was then sailing off. Beagle was the Darwin, uh, was Darwin's ship. Um, and he had to cancel his last trip that he still wanted to do. But he visits the botanical gardens in addition to several other places, of course. So, but let's talk a little bit about his achievements. And uh, one of the things he was so keen to do was to establish the height of Teide Volcano, the presumably tallest peak in the world. Well, he sets out to do that, and he's not the first to try that. Several attempts had been made before. The uh, last one before him was by Charles Baudin, a French uh, researcher, in 1776. And the way it was done was by triangulation. You take two known points and you try to work out the third one by, well, geometrical calculation. And um, he realizes rather quickly, well, the peak of Tate is not that close to the sun and he doesn't actually have to be worried about being burned when he goes up there. That's a very important realization. And uh, here's the different estimates of uh, Tate's height, Tate's altitude. And you can see it goes back to um, well, Italian researchers and all sorts of folks who had a go. And um, here we go through the years. And uh, indeed, Charles Bordard actually had a very good estimate with 3,713 meters. And then Humboldt came in 1799, and he comes up with 3,736 meters. And as you realize, all the other estimates are completely off. None of them overlaps. But this one here overlaps almost perfectly with the previous estimate. That was the first match. And that meant Humboldt kind of got it. But Humboldt was perfectly aware that the French gentleman, Charles Bourdin, actually did the real job. So there's this quote by Humboldt. And uh, everybody gave him the credit, but he realized it wasn't his. So he says, there's three stages of scientific discovery. First, people deny it's true. Then they deny it's important. And finally, they credit the wrong person. So, and it's actually, to, <laughs> to a degree, it's still true today, I find in the science that it may not always be the first person like Charles Baudin who works it out. It may be the one who kind of makes the finding public and that person may get more credit. So here, Humboldt was uh, standing on the shoulders of a French giant, if you will, and um, he got the credit for it. So, but then there was this other problem, and that was the eruption. And here we have a drawing, again, from a French researcher about the 1798 eruption. Of course, by the time Humboldt arrives, the eruption had stopped. But 
he was able to look at the rocks there and uh, he was going up to Tate volcano and um, nowadays we can go there with a cable car of course he had to go on uh, the back of a mule for most parts and on foot and he climbs the summit of Tater and um, this is a few impressions from the summit cone of Tater and there's a bit of sulfur here volcanic sulfur and there's this little peak here sitting above the main part of the volcano this peak comes from a medieval eruption and uh, it's a young feature of the volcano and well Humboldt starts to feel that some things are a bit odd with this concept of basalt forming on the ocean floor because he sees that there's lava coming from the peak and running downhill but never ever reaching the ocean floor so he starts to get very skeptical at that point allegedly he also visits the ice cave and uh, some of the porters he employed they wanted to go to the ice cave the uh, reason was that they would pick ice there and they would bring it down to Orotava and they would sell the ice to the rich people to make sorbets so uh, the porters were very keen to make an extra penny because they were up there already so he visits the ice cave because some of the porters wanted to break some ice and bring it down so Humboldt is struck not just by the volcanic features but also by the sparse vegetation and he realizes that altitude has an effect on vegetation so he also notes that there is this crown of forest the corona forestal and you see it coming in here and suddenly it stops it's really sharp actually once you look at it from a distance and here we have this pine forest and at a certain altitude of about 2000 meters it just dies off so here's a few more impressions he also notes that there is what we nowadays call the sea of clouds and that this is a main source of moisture for the pine forest and he sees all these links that nobody has really made beforehand and he draws these sketches with a peak of Tede and he sees that the plant life changes that the pine forest comes in at about a thousand meters altitude and stops at 2000 that you have palm trees in the lower part and that the clouds coincide with where the forests are the pine forest and he starts to draw this and makes these links he was very good at visualizing things and I'll come back to this in a few minutes because he was the first to draw things in illustrations that we nowadays call cartoons and scientific papers he was really pioneering this concept so and he also of course notes that the vegetation at the coast is very lush and this is where the agriculture happens this is where you can grow bananas and uh, um, pineapples etc etc and higher up it changes towards uh, the forests which are maybe useful for timber but not for traditional agriculture so he comes up with this sketch here and uh, here the distribution of plants and in vertical direction and uh, here he says the pine uh, sorry the, the palm trees down here agricultural fields and then there is a leafy forest and then there's pine forest and then above a certain level there is no forest left and only a few shrubs are left and then we go to the peak of Tater and he recognizes this change and he concludes that the change in altitude that plants see is actually similar to the change in latitude if you go up towards the north pole you will see similar changes so he also realized on that trip that well this idea about lava and ocean water doesn't really work so well and uh, he would have seen these rocks I don't have a record of this but he would have seen them on the way this is the lavas negras this is a medieval eruption of Tede volcano and if you happen to have a chance to go to the Tede National Park you will also see them they're striking they're shiny black obsidian lavas and uh, they come from the peak and they come down into the lower part of the caldera de las cañadas but they don't go further so he would have seen where the lavas came from and that they stopped no ocean floor involved and uh, this would have made him think that something wasn't quite right with this traditional concept that his teacher professor werner would have told him 
So here's a few impressions of this, and this is how these rocks look like. There you have flow banding in the rocks, and they're very shiny, they're obsidian, and here's a classic tongue of the lava coming down here, and then it stops, and this is not an ocean floor feature. In fact, if you look at the map today, this is a modern map of the Lavas Negras, which erupted in about 1150 before present. Uh, you'll see that they all stop here. And there's this beautiful road here, and uh, I always make that joke with the students that the lava was very kind, it just stopped before hitting the road, but of course the road is younger. And um, here we see that none of these lavas ever reached the sea. It's very obvious they emanated from the volcano and they didn't go to the ocean, never saw any ocean, and Humboldt was smart enough to realize that. So, I mentioned this story about Arotava. He was uh, very much in love with Arotava, and some people say it's because of this daughter of one of the noble families, but of course it was surely also a very lovely sight. It was very lush, very green, and uh, there he had <coughs> a viewpoint looking down into the valley, and it's still known as Humboldt's viewpoint. You can go there today, and he describes three volcanic cones. And... Uh, well, people were a bit skeptical because if you go there today, you only see one and a half. One is half gone and one is still there. This one has a hotel, this one has a church on top, and uh, the third one was never found. It turns out the third one was quarried away for the little particles, and uh, now it's been actually found. It sits, oh, uh, it, it's, it sat behind uh, this third one, uh, this second one here, so, but it's completely gone. And um, this one here is heavily damaged, you see this side. So uh, it's now protected, it cannot be quarried anymore, but of course it lost its original beauty. And uh, this uh, is a bit sad because uh, Humboldt apparently said, I'm leaving almost with tears in my eyes, I would like to settle here. He liked the Orotava Valley so much, and this is a a statue of Humboldt sitting there looking at the Orotava Valley. So if you go there, you um, can actually look at the same perspective that he had. Now, having said this, we must also realize it did a lot of good, this concept of using volcanic particles. I talked about it the other day, and this is something that has been widely used, and he actually makes reference to this. And um, here we have these uh, Lageria fields on Lanzarote, which some of you would have seen today, but, uh, well, unfortunately. So you can see some of them here. It's no a perfect replacement, I'm sure, but um, people there recognized very quickly spreading volcanic material on the fields is very good, makes the soil more fertile. Once you manage to protect the plants against the wind, either by having them in small depressions or by building little shelter walls, then you can suddenly grow a lot of crops there that wasn't able uh, previously. And uh, here, one of the valleys in Lanzarote, and you see the entire valley floor is full with these little walls and these little depressions, and uh, wine is grown there. And I mentioned it the other day, the uh, wine from the Canaries got so famous, it was drank at the Vienna Congress in 1816, where Europe was subdivided into a pre-Napoleonic kind of arrangement again. And uh, the nobles of Europe enjoyed the Canary wine, and it was considered one of the finest wines in the world at the time. So, but then Humboldt travels on after his week in Tenerife, and uh, he then um, travels to the north of South America, and here's a few dates. Um, he goes to Caracas, and then in November of that year, and uh, he explores the surroundings there. Then in 1800 to uh, early 1800 to November 1800, he um, explores Venezuela and the Orinoco. Then 1801, he goes to Cuba. And then 1802, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru. And there he's uh, suddenly confronted with these ginormous volcanoes, Chimborazo and uh, etc. And this is where he throws away this concept of basalt coming from the ocean floor entirely. And he accepts that basalt forms from lava. 
So he had completely detached from his schooling at the time. And uh, this was his big trip starting here in Spain via the Canaries there to uh, Venezuela and then exploring the Orinoco here, coming back here and then traveling around to Cuba and then back here to this part, the uh, western part of uh, South America. And then eventually he went up to Mexico from where he then left for the US. So Jim Barrazo was one of his major adventures and um, he was traveling with a colleague, a French researcher, and Chimborazo here is 6,263 meters above sea level. This is an enormous altitude, and he tries to climb it, but uh, his friend, uh, the French researcher, he was not quite as keen to go all the way up, and um, so he had a go, and uh, he also notes that there's vertical changes in um, vegetation, so this concept is reinforced. He hires a bunch of porters to help him, but he struggles at 5,878 meters above sea level, he gives up. He is completely struck by altitude sickness, and he says, I can't go any further. When I was in the Andes a few years ago, I went to, I set myself the task of going to the uh, boundary of uh, human settlement, which is believed to be 5,333 meters. It was determined at a volcano called Aucanquilchan in Chile, and above which miners just refused to live, and so it was marked as the boundary of where human settlements is no longer possible on a permanent basis. I went up there and I left a team of people behind and I walked up there with a Chilean colleague and uh, I really thought I was hiking for maybe an hour up and back and by the time we came back to our remaining team, everybody was really sick and, and they were really angry with us and I couldn't quite understand what was going on and they told us we were away for three and a half hours. So my sense of time was completely distorted and uh, the highest I made was 500 meters below Humboldt, but it was quite an intense experience and many people are not well at this altitude. So I can sympathize with him that he didn't make it further. He has complete forgiveness from my side. So, so Humboldt then in America, he cruises to Mexico and he stays in Mexico for a while and then eventually he goes back to Paris via the US where he meets Thomas Jefferson for a dinner, I understand, and a conversation. So uh, he then starts to write up all his experiences and all his knowledge and this concept of vertical changes comes back in many forms and he sees this in the Andes and Tenerife was giving him the first glimpse of this. And here is a sketch where he draws different landscapes he's seen. It's an imaginary sketch because suddenly there's the Andes and Tenerife in the same sketch, but he kind of pictures this concept of altitude and he realizes Tede is not that tall after all. Tede is actually one of the smaller features compared to things like Chimborazo in the Andes. So he then works out how plants change and you see how meticulous he notes all the different species that he observed and then there's a snow covered peak and uh, he uh, really describes the Andean changes in incredible detail and uh, this adds to this base of knowledge that he created. And here he then compares eventually the Andes with various other travels and information from travels. And here's Tenerife, he realizes that the Andean situation is fundamentally different. Uh, in the Andes it's a lot higher and uh, that the peak of Teide only reaches the lower snow boundary of what the Andes would have. So his views of nature is then published 1808 in three editions and he publishes a number of travel books and uh, this gave him a huge amount of success his lectures were so popular. Uh, some people think they were a bit like music concerts today. People were flocking to his lectures. And uh, he was uh, obviously a very good presenter. And uh, people were, of course, fascinated to hear about his travels and all these experiences from distant part of the world. Now, let me bring back a few real accomplishments, a few real life accomplishments, apart from understanding nature. He also did some good 
and uh, he was one of the few people to realize that uh, guano actually has a very positive effect. And he took a sample back, he brought a sample back to Europe, he had it chemically analyzed, and he realized it's a fantastic fertilizer. And he really started a huge trade at the time, the guano trade. And only in about 1910 to 1920, uh, when we started to uh, make artificial fertilizers, did this really stop. So a guano boom resulted from Humboldt's initial discovery, and uh, it lasted certainly into the uh, early parts of the last century. So then, at some point, it's said that Humboldt ran out of cash. Uh, I don't know how true that is, but uh, he returns to Prussia. And he enters Prussian state service again. And uh, he was, of course, more than welcome to do so. And uh, he starts to lecture at the university. And actually, the university is nowadays named after him and his brother, the Humboldt University in Berlin. And uh, he writes these famous lectures up into several books, the Cosmos Lectures, as it's known. You can still buy them today, of course. And then he still does a few trips. He travels to Siberia, for example, and he starts to publish the lectures bit by bit. And they also brought him a certain amount of financial independence there. He uh, lives at his family estate, and this is his library here, Humboldt in old age. And uh, he still has all these souvenirs from his travels and all the books. So he had a very academic life, I guess, and he had the means to afford such a life. So he eventually dies in 1859, and uh, this is some of the last images. And this is actually a very early photograph of Humboldt in his last I guess, month of his life. So he's buried um, in Tegel in the family seat. And uh, this is where he is still kind of, you know, remembered today. You can go there. It's a little museum there now. And here's a wonderful uh, painting here with an old Humboldt and Chimborazo in the background. Of course, old Humboldt was not in South America. So this was only a young Humboldt who was there. But this giant discovery, this journey of discovery that he did as a young man, it stayed with him in his mind. So I always thought it's a beautiful idea to bring these two aspects together, a very mature thinker that was influenced by these wonderful observations as a young man. So Humboldt's accomplishment, he collected 60,000 plants and animal specimens on his travels, many of which previously unknown. He recognized ocean currents, the Humboldt current, and he recognized many plants are useful as a remedy. He developed the first climate zone models. And uh, of course, he developed models of altitude and plant systematics. So this is not drawn by Humboldt himself, but as you might just about read here, it's drawn from the accounts of Humboldt. So this is something we still work with today. So here we see different climate zones, and this is uh, Africa, and we are just about here in the Canaries. You see the dry part of northern Africa. This was already something Humboldt described. So countless places and phenomena were named after Humboldt, and um, he was somebody who believed in the unity uh, of nature, that nature was somehow self-contained and that there was a natural balance. I think he's right in many ways, not always, of course. But he influenced a lot of thinkers like Darwin, of course, and also uh, Muir, the uh, uh, pioneer who uh, pushed for the national parks in the US. So he was also a fan of Humboldt. So, and he, believe it or not, he already warned about deforestation and monoculture some 200 years ago. And he also predicted if things would be pushed further, he predicted human-induced climate change would be a, a thing to be considered. So his rather holistic view was quite uh, breathtaking and he uh, kind of uh, was hugely influential, influential. Later on, some of these rather benign ideas about the balance of nature was replaced by Darwin's much, much harder view on natural selection. Darwin did not think that there was a natural balance. Darwin was convinced that one 
species will forcefully replace another if it is fitter than the other. And nowadays we have to recognize that uh, Humboldt's views are only temporarily true that there's a balance of things, but in the long run over geological time, Darwin is probably more correct. So this is kind of uh, some of the drawings from Humboldt just to kind of close here. And uh, his legacy is quite wide. He was the person bringing botanical gardens to mainland Europe. He recognized all these interactions between geology, landscape geography, the living world, and human activity. He pioneered data visualization, as I've just said a few minutes ago. And believe it or not, more species and places are named after Humboldt than any other human being that ever walked on this planet. <laughs>